Tonight we're talking war, W-A-R, war. Uh, we are at war. We, we, have, we are in the midst of a cultural war. But I want you to go back 20 years. We're on the 9-10. Uh, you remember 9-10? Uh, the day before, and then 9-11 hit, and then the next few days after that. The front side of war, uh, there was a cause. We narrowed it. Within months, we narrowed that cause to Afghanistan. That the rise of Hamas, the rise of um, Al-Qaeda, all of these groups were functioning there. So we had a cause, war. America was united. We, had a, we were unified. We had a purpose. The President of the United States had a bullhorn standing with the fire chief on, on what rubble was left of the Twin Towers. And yes, we see you and you're going to see us. And our nation rallied to that. That's war. That's the front side of war. The, the back side of that war, go 20 years now forward with us, um, there's great concern. A general said uh, today on an interview with a conservative talk host that within six months to one year, we will have to find a way to be back in Afghanistan because of the great buildup of, of uh, tribal and um, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, all of these groups. So the backside of this war doesn't have what the front side had. We find no cause. We, we find concern. Uh, 20 years later, it, we have created a terrorist Disneyland now uh, for, for them. The media is not interested. They do not cover it. They're done. They have walked away. There's a cold ear toward anything Afghanistan. So war. You say, well, why, do you, why do you want to talk about war for? Um, all of us have, have been in or at one now or will be in some form of fight or war, personally, family, state, da-da-da. When you see a session of Congress, it's, it is a war uh, today over the spending. Uh, one congressman let out a spew of curse words toward another one because the other one wasn't willing to even talk about dropping this bill a trillion dollars. And they bounce a trillion around like I would bounce a basketball. You know, it's, it's, you know but, but you got to think about this. A trillion here, a trillion there, that adds up to real money eventually. You know, so anyway, huge fight, wars going on. The President of the United States met at 1130 with um, people who were in this war, not allowing it to go forward. So let's look at the front side of war, and you'll see in a minute why I'm going to talk about this. Because it's, it's all about an enemy. Whether we want to think it or not, the, the whole Christian faith has enemies. And, and they're, they're being defined for us. We don't have to go out. And sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot. Back in 1980, I remember sitting uh, in this room. I was invited into this room. And in comes evangelist James Robinson, who, was, who at that time was still preaching with Billy Graham. And everyone thought that he would take over a lot of Billy Graham's ministry when, when Billy Graham died. He comes into the room and he's talking to about 25 of us pastors. He said, I just got off the plane from Chicago meeting with Jack Hiles. Jack Hiles was pastor of First Baptist Church Hammond, the largest Sunday school in the world in the 80s. And he's, he's dead now. But um, uh, Hammond is an Indiana suburb of Chicago. So anyway, he said, well, I asked Dr. Hiles, would you consider joining, coming in together? So I just uh, flew down to Virginia, met with Jerry Falwell yesterday, and we want to create a thing called the Moral Majority. Anybody even remember that in 1980 when it was born? I was in the room and I just as a kid and had no business even being there. I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at these guys and, wow, this is really cool. We're going to fight? Cool. This is awesome. And the moral majority was started in 1980, Memphis, Tennessee. A guy by the name of Adrian Rogers got into the picture, and then here we went. Changed the landscape, but there was a war. Dr. Hiles' answer to James Robinson was this. He said, he said, well, who all's coming? He said, well, the leader of the Mormon church is even talking about it. He said, well, I'd just soon join with you to fight the Mormons. <laughs> it's to fight the liberals. And, that, and he never did join. No, I'm not joining that. You see... War is where you find it, and many, in fact, if, attempt to define the enemy. What, what is your enemy? D does anyone remember this phrase? The enemy 
of my enemy is my friend. You know, that, that's actually an ancient Muslim, it was, it was first found on Sanskrit, like on, on cloth. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So it was an old Muslim, and then it was brought in in America in the first time, 1884, in some political election it was used, and then it became a well-known phrase. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So, so define enemy. Define enemy. Enemy is one who sees no value in your values. One who despises what you revere. Now that's mine. It took me all afternoon to come up with what an enemy is. So someone who, who may be downtown in the church who said, you've been hearing what that preacher up on the top, you hear what he's saying, you da da da. He's not an enemy because he values the same thing I value. He just may feel a different way about it. And he may have a different definition of, of what an enemy is. Our enemies are those who see no value in your values. Uh, I know many Muslim people. And uh, one of the men I traded with in, in a gas station there in Alma for years was he came, uh, he and his brother came and bought three gas stations and quick marts, you know, that kind of thing. And, and he became a friend. Once my wife's car broke down and uh, wouldn't start, and he, he was getting his truck to leave, he turned back around and saw who it was. I couldn't get there uh, for a while. He sat right there with her 40 some odd minutes until I got there. That's a Muslim friend. So you, if you say, I hate Muslims, yeah, you got, wait a minute. When I was in Israel, the man who befriended me the most was a Muslim. I mean, I would like for them all to be jerks. I would like for them all to be like we think a Muslim should be, but it's just not that way. So define enemy, one who sees no value in my values, one who despises what I revere. Psalm 3, here we go. <clears throat> this is from David. Lord, how they have increased who troubled me. Now, if I stop right there and you look at the verse, Lord... How have they increased who trouble me? It's not a question mark at the end of the sentence. It's exclamations. It's a declarative. Lord, they're increasing. What do you see already? You see a number. Lord, how have they increased who trouble me? Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Now we're only going to get through verse 6, I think, this evening. But we're going to talk about war. What war is. And David is not in a national war at this time. He's already been in one. His own son uh, was hu hunting him. And so uh, he had both the king hunting him and his own son hunting him. He was in a, in a family turmoil out of this world. So he's in a war. So a war has to have enemies. And you have to remember that when a war is being fought, two nations fight a war. Both sides call the other person what? Enemy right? So they both have to have a view of some value that is despised by the other value. And that's why when we, when we think in this country back in the Civil War, how many people that we lost, brother, the, 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 the Dakota Sioux Indians called it the very best. They called it the brother-brother war. How many hundreds of thousands of people were lost in this war, the brother-brother war? But we have the same values. We have the same God. We were praying to the same Heavenly Father. We were asking the same Holy Spirit to bless our army over their army. Well, that's war. From the front side, unified, a cause, a reason to go. The back side, concern. Uh, and, and in this nation, and I, I do bring many things that are happening in our culture today into the Scripture. A pastor asked me the other day, he said, why do you continually stop when you're reading about a text and put application of what's happening today. Duh. I didn't say that then. Good. Duh. If it is applicable, that's, that is the must of Scripture. Why do you not do that? Why do you act as though it has no, no application to today? It's the very same thing. That's why God's Word is relevant. It will always be relevant in any argument. And that's when I say, if you're going to defend the Word of God, all you got to do is open the cage. It is the Word of God that's quick and is powerful. It is the Word of God. It's not what I'm saying about the Word. So, um, I'm only going to give you two points tonight. The first is the rise of trouble. The rise of trouble. Uh, verse 1 and 2. Lord, how have they increased who trouble me? Many are they who rise up against me. There are two key words here. Increase. See in verse 1, increase. And the second word, verse 2, um, or at the end of verse 1, rise. 
These are two different words. The word increase means the ways they are troubling me. Lord, the ways they are troubling me are amounting. Have you ever noticed that once you get in trouble with someone or about something or in a situation that it just normally escalates and gets worse? Why is that? Someone that you had no trouble with yesterday, all of a sudden today, we were pulling out of, uh, out of Sam's and Conway. That's my favorite Sam's in the whole universe. Jan hates those turnabouts. She hates turnabouts. <laughs> roundabouts, I'm sorry. Yeah, round, well, in Australia, they're called turnabouts. She hates them. And she, she, doesn't, she hates to go to that side of town. She hates that Sam's. I love it because she hates it, so I just spin around them. I think it's cool. Anyway, she hates. So we're over there, and a guy, he's got um, a, an old Corvette. It's old. I mean, really old, antique old, and it's shiny. It's pretty. Lady didn't quite get out of that just right. Bammed him, and he gets out. And the look on his face, if I, were, if I could have been a photographer, the look on his face, and pull that up close, I mean, it was as though he had lost his universe. Because that car meant something. I said, wow, if we could just stay. And the couple who got out, now you'd, you'd like for it to be a young, arrogant kid, real cocky. But this sweet old lady gets out. And she's crying. Now he wants to have an enemy here. He wants to. And she gets out crying. And so I told you, no, turn around, look, look. She turns around. He's hugging her. Telling her not to worry. It's all okay. I said, see uh, how life goes on. So what I'm saying about what all happens in a war and a fight, what could, what could have been a huge enemy to him, he could not allow. He saw the value that she valued. He valued that more than he did. You have to get to the point and the place in your life that the hurt means less than the hope of it leaving you. See, that's why some of you may have a hard time forgiving someone else. The hurt is still so real that you cannot find a way to let go of that hurt. And until you can let go, you, you are creating a, a vacuum for an enemy. War. First, the rise of trouble. Lord, how they increase. These are ways that it just keeps building. Now, things just go wrong. You have a day when you just started the day out and you begin to think, Lord, this day can't get any worse. And then you realize that was a real dumb thing to say. It's, it is, there are days that are just going to be that way. And I think they're intended. I think they're set up that way. I, th I just think it's a divining rod of reality. It's just going to be this way today. And I know I, 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 there are guys who are flowery and can make it. Everything is just beautiful. And re everything is beautiful in its own way. But life is just not that way. Um, the, the concept then of war is there's a rise of trouble. Whenever we have a rise of trouble, there's an increase. The number of ways they are troubling me, verse 1, he says. Now, the second word is rise. Uh, the number of ways that they are troubling me, Lord, they're growing. Many are they who rise up. Now, the rise up now is an alignment of enemies. They're, they're forming a, um, a group against me. Well, this, this is bad. There's an alignment of enemies. Right now, in the rise of trouble in our country, let's think about it for a moment. Uh, we, we have the rise of trouble. Money. Uh, Moody Financial, which has been a financial forecaster for more than, I think, 35 years. They're very good. I'm not saying they're conservative or liberal. I don't know any of that. I just know that they write really good stuff about money and the wise use of money. They came out yesterday with their report that the inflation rate right now is costing the average American family from, I think, 45 or 50 days ago, $175 more per month just to live than it did 45 days ago. Now, see, that's putting it down where you and I get it. When you say, give me another 175 bucks out of your wallet just to have the same thing that we have last month. That's the rise of trouble. Um, the average family... Um, puts through a bank, this is all billionaires and the poorest of poor, the average family puts $61,000 through a bank writing checks every year. Now, rather than Congress saying, you know, we want to use your money wisely, 
they are doing a very foolish thing and they are saying, we want more. So we want to look at all transactions of $60,000, knowing that the average family puts $61,000 through the bank in every year. So what's that about? Uh, who works for whom? Who, who is making the decision? So money, this is, a, this is a real rise of trouble in our life. Uh, I paid $3 flat at, for gas downtown um, a little while ago. It's, it, so it hit three bucks. And I'm on every, I'm on Shell's group, I'm on Casey's group, I'm on Walmart's group, save up, get, you know, get 100 points, get the three cents or 10 cents off a gallon. I'm on everybody's points that you can get. But, you know, um, this is where it becomes a major factor in our life, money. Look at family. Have you, have you kept up with the uh, Loudoun County, Virginia case, the school board? If you know what I'm talking about, you, you know, uh, this, this is the city, this is the small town in Virginia that the school board wrote a letter and uh, the Department of Justice, in fact, the Attorney General today, which I don't know, this is my first time to hear him today. This boy should be placed somewhere for to be checked out. Garland is his name. I'm telling you, he is a loony boony. The school board who wrote this sent another letter saying, we apologize for this letter. It should never have been written. We're sorry. Please take this recommendation down. He wouldn't do it today, and he, and he, he, he will not do that. This is, this is the, the little county, the little school thing where the, the parents are now called um, terrorists, uh, homeland terrorists, or uh, I forget the other term for it, but domestic terrorists, yeah. Okay, and, and the guy that got put in jail because his daughter was raped and he was only there to talk about it, all things have been forgiven. Now that lawsuits are turned around, he's suing all of them. Family, see what I'm saying? This is a war now. This is a war. CRT. Um, one national official said no one in America is teaching critical race theory. No one? Then why, why are we fighting? But it's disguised as something else. Um, the Loudoun County, Virginia, the guy said I identify as a girl, but he raped a girl in the bathroom. Uh, and they, the superintendent, his name is Ziegler, he's pushing this agenda so much that he told the school board what had happened before he went on television saying it's not true. I'm telling you, could you imagine someone so obsessed with, with an agenda that you would let a little girl who was violated and raped let it go to protect this agenda? That's a war against family. We're in a war. You say, well, that's down in Virginia. I know, it's a small town in Virginia, uh, but it's still us, it is us. And so um, we, we look at the cancel culture thing. Where's it gonna stop? Uh, this week, uh, it was Thomas Jefferson. Statue of Thomas Jefferson came down and was put, put away. Why? Because this was offensive. We're taking marching orders in a war uh, from people who do not value our values. So it's war, and that's, that's what we're trying to say. Look at taxation. Gas hit three bucks today. It's uh, six dollars in a lot of places in California. Seven dollars on the on the other coast. The greatest enemy of freedom today is not the six dollar gas. It is that the American family is losing the freedom by which to protest anything. Uh, look at um, the uh, the media today as another another. How my enemies are increasing against me. It's uh, the media. Absolutely, every platform that you can imagine, every single platform, social platforms. Um, the uh, chief Taliban officer has both Twitter and Facebook, and it does not violate their community standards. It just blows me away, but that's war. See, it's war. The, the problem with this war is getting people to understand it's, it's not about politics. And I know, I know some people do not like some of the things I say. I get that. I understand it. But I'm not talking from a political position saying vote for someone or go to this party because I don't think any of them have the answers. I think what I'm trying to say is that everything has become political. Everything has been politicized to the point that this is where the war has dropped to. So the rise of trouble. They increase and they rise. And many are they. So our family, taxation. Look at the, uh, right now, um, I talked to my daughter in Little Rock, 
who hires for Walmart. And uh, she said, right now, we just hope the people that <laughs> are coming in for it, we just hope they can pass the drug test. We're, we're looking for anybody. We're looking for anybody. 10.4 million jobs could be filled tomorrow. 10.4 million. And yet there are still incentives that are saying, and I, and I love what, uh, who's the Democrat from West Virginia who's thinking about being independent? Uh, Manch, Joe Manchin. This is what he said today. Mr. President, you are creating an, entitle, an entitlement society. That's pretty good. Pretty good words. Who wants to go to work? Uh, I'm still getting a check. 10.4 million jobs. Uh, 10.4 million jobs open right now that, that need help. I, I imagine we could hire a million people unloading boats if we could just get them, <laughs> just get them docked up. Yeah, Black Friday may be out on sea dues this year. You know, I don't <laughs> The rise of trouble, they increase. How many of them are lining up with the vaccine? Um, you, can, you write this one down. If I'm wrong on this one, I'll shut up. Five to 11-year-olds, will be. it will be approved within the week. It will be mandated within the month. And when that happens, you can look for World War III to break out in this country in a, in a, in a sense, metaphorically, because that's, that one's going to push it. That's going to push them over the edge. But it has now become, I, I have had to answer because of surgery and hospitals and da-da-da every day. Have you had COVID? Have you been infected? Da-da-da-da. And have you had the vaccine? Now, the, the dividing, and all of you go through this. I mean, all of you, you have to make up your mind what you're going to do. But the, the thing in the loss of freedom and the rise of trouble is this. Uh, we are being forced into having opinion that does not, have any value to it. They, they literally do not care. The 22-year-old Washington State cop, 22-year uh, veteran, 22 years he's been there, he handed in his badge yesterday. And I, I have been in the room with cops who retired, who show no emotion at all. And when they lay that gun down and that badge, after 25 years, they break down. And most of them just kind of vanish off. It's their life. He walked in and laid it down because he, I think he'd hit the deadline. They said, you're out. You would think the response, my gosh, we're losing a 22-year veteran off, off the state cop uh, uh, roster. You know what the, the response was? Thank goodness another non-vaxxer is gone. See? That was from a government official for the state of Washington. That's how they look at it, folks. That's war. There's a war. Now, I'm not trying to incite you to riot. Uh, or to jump over the fence or break a window. That doesn't do any good. Or to go to Portland and, and camp out for 90 days and destroy the downtown. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to downtown Portland, but it would have been one of my top five cities to say, you know what, that is the coolest downtown, I think, ever. But it's trash today. But um, I'm not saying we need to incinerate to do that. I'm simply saying there's a rise of trouble because it's war. Now then, we go from verse 1 and 2, there's a rise of trouble. And you say, well, you know what, I, I come in here on Wednesday night, my life's pretty peaceful. I'm, I'm not like you, I'm not out here <laughs> throwing fires around. So I'm pretty peaceful. I get that, I understand that. But you're still in the same culture of war. And you're still pressed with the same decisions. And there, there is, a, um, I think, a, I was walking into, a, I don't know where we were. Let me think on this just for a minute. Oh, I, I remember uh, it was when all the, the mass thing was all, all going. You had to have certain things. And so uh, and my wife's very quiet, and particularly in public. She's very quiet. She's never going to be in a situation in public unless you cross her with the kids or something. Uh, anyway, this person asked her, uh, have you been around anyone for COVID? Da, da, da. And she said, have you? <laughs> and she said, ma'am, I don't have to answer that. She said, well, neither do I. And I looked over like, who's that? <laughs> That's kind of where we all are. We've just about had it with that. So it's a war. And I remember uh, as we started this, there was a two-week thing. Today at 5 o'clock it was announced that there is a, you're not going to want to hear this. You may have already heard it, but did you? There is a four booster. Another booster will be produced, and it will be here within 60 days. Well, what I'm saying to you is, I don't know if you have any idea in the culture of war what this means. It means that Pfizer, 
moves up again as one of the richest organizations on the globe. They're making billions and billions and billions of dollars. But another, another mandate. Well, we kind of blew it on the first one, the second one, the third one, but we got you covered this time. So, uh, class warfare. Uh, you've heard it called the billionaire's tax. We're in a warfare. The billion, anytime you target any group, rich, single, poor, da -da, Muslim, <laughs> Mormon, whatever, we're going after this group. That's why, that's why our government is saying this is, this is, no, this is a no tax. This is a no tax. It's, it's class warfare. It's not the wise use of money. It is we want more money. More money will not fix. And I, uh, Macaulay, in running for governor again in Virginia, said we need to put more money in public schools. Absol no one loves school kids more than me. I have taught in classrooms. I've principled. I've run schools, Christian schools, you name it. I love kids. I, I bootlegged being a student pastor even up as late as five years ago when we were without one. So I, I told everyone, our associate pastor is going to be the lead pastor. I'm going to be over here. I'm going to be the student minister for the next 90 days. Boy, we had a lot of fun. Uh, I, was, I was tired a lot. But, and kids are stupid, you know. Uh, they're just dumb today. No, nah, I'm just kidding. But anyway, we had a big time. And... Um, I love children, but I'm going to tell you, you can throw all the money you want to at a system that is totally warped out of existence. You will not fix what's wrong with a child or what's wrong in the system or what's wrong. And thank God for small country schools. Every time I pass, whether it's Quitman or Rosebud and Heber and all these schools are still shadowed and, and sheltered, whether Clinton, Jonesboro, all, you know, still sort of sheltered. I thank God for that because... Uh, the influence that is coming is in alignment against us, and it is coming. It will be here. There is a rise, uh, alignment of enemies against us. Hey, did you ever hear this phrase before? Keep your friends close. Finish it now. Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Why is that? You need good peripheral vision. Anytime I almost have a wreck, I say to my wife, and this drives her nuts, I said, you must always have great view, our, our peripheral vision. You always have, and she, oh yeah. I, said, I always say that because it was like, whew, bless God, we just almost got smacked right there. And it was nothing to do with me, and I knew that. But you got to have a presence of your surroundings. Always have a keen presence of your surroundings. I learned that. I was standing with a cop. Uh, every year I put on a fall festival, and we had 30 acre campus. We'd have 1,500, sometimes 2,000 people come. Always had police everywhere. I'm standing by two policemen. We're just visiting, eating candy corn, visiting, talking. And I says to the one, I said, what are you doing? And he said, just, you know, you know nothing. I said, well, don't worry about it. I said, okay. I'm watching him. Next thing I know, he's on walkie-talkie. Next thing I know, there's two going this way and there's one going this way. Next thing I know, they ease up to this guy. And he said, come over here, please. And he put up a little uh, resist. And um, 30 seconds, they had him down and out. They had two warrants on him, and he's, he was coming with kids getting his candy. They didn't want to do that there. But his presence, he had a keen presence. Then I'm standing with another one. This was another year. I'm standing with another one. He walks up to this guy, and he says, I'll give you 30 seconds to get off this church campus. 30 seconds. The guy looked at him kind of funny. Then he looked down at his watch, and he took off. I said, what was that about? He said, I've had my eye on him for a long time. He means bad. A keen presence of your surrounding doesn't mean you'll know who the enemy is. It means that you have a sense of who the enemy could be. So there's a rise or an alignment of against us. Keep your friends close, but your enemies even closer. When, when school boards begin to say that we're domestic terrorists because we stand up for something we believe in, or the guy running for governor in, in Virginia says that parents have no right to what is being taught in the classroom, is they're like, oh, wait a minute, I thought that's kind of what property taxes were all about. I thought that was that, that gave us this employer-employee relation. All right, let's go verse 3, 4, and 5, and then it shall be time for Brother Benny's cupcakes. And if you don't mind, I need to get a picture of that because of what y'all pulled when I didn't get my the cake thing, which was just wrong. Verse 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. Now, you're going to notice there are four things that there should be rest in truth. There's a rise in trouble, there is, but there's also always a rest in truth. Verse 3, 
Uh, see if you can find these four things. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Verse 6 is the answer to verse 1. Do you see how, how he comes at the end of verse 6, which answers verse 1, which means, Lord, there's a bunch of folks out there. He finishes in verse 6, well, I don't care if there's 10,000 of them. If you were to name your enemies today, and I don't mean enemies over Facebook or enemies over a family mess or who got the car and who didn't get the car or whatever. I'm talking about people who have no value of your values. You'll find you have very few enemies. And that's why I keep putting application to state, to, to government, to, um, uh, and that's why I think we should be praying uh, often. We ought to put the name of our senators, state senators, and in, in the bulletin, here they are. Pray for them, pray for them. State governments have never been more influential than they are at this moment in time. This will become the most, in fact, the, the state senators I know, the representatives I know, I say, listen, I'm praying for you because you are the firewall of freedom right now. Everything from the federal is going to come down to state in which the state will say, not in this state. This is not going to happen in the state of Arkansas or the state of Texas or whatever. So there should be rest in truth. Now, let's hear the four things. First, the shield. You are my shield. What does the shield do? <laughs> yeah, I, I use the shield out in front. Always got to be in front. A shield is no good unless it's out in front. When I was in Israel getting to work with Holocaust victims, um, I went to a particular apartment where we were recording, and that went to the University of Chicago, they, and they translated. They were all Russian Jews, but I did the, the, did the interview, and they translated it, but then the, the video was put. University of Chicago took the video and did it. So anyway, we're, we're at, on, the, on the northern bank where all the bombs are, are flung in on there on the, on the northern bank. You've heard of the, of the bank. Well, this, that's where that was, on the Syrian border. And so anyway, uh, this lady's showing me her apartment where a bomb had come through. Now, every apartment that is built in the state of Israel has with it, if you get a little one-bedroom apartment, it has a bomb shelter, guaranteed by the state. It's put in there. And so anyway, uh, she, she told me where, where this bomb had gone off. Then I understood more about the shield. The shield came up under Ronald Reagan. The shield was just voted on again, the Iron Dome, was just voted on again by Congress, who many of them said they did not want to support that. Um, and that's the one thing that keeps all the bombs off of them. But it, it is a literal shield uh, that keeps them off the Scud missiles. A shield is something that deflects. The purpose of it is to deflect. So if you'll start looking at this, Lord, you are my shield, not, not my circumstance, not my worship of you, not how I feel at the moment, not my emotions at the moment, you the person of God is my shield. Verse 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. There is a, um, a calm that comes over us in the storm when we realize that we're protected. Because I've been going back and forth to the hospital with my sister, my wife's up there. But anyway, she texted me a little bit ago and said, you may need to sleep in the church tonight. Why? Because the winds are going to be violent. A uh, trailer weighs 14,000 pounds, but of course, if an, e, an E0 tornado would put that trailer on top of this roof in nothing flat. And we have ridden them out before. We were in a Texas tornado one time, and, and that's another story. Anyway, uh, she said, you may want to sleep in the church. I said, have you ever slept in a church at night with it all dark? No, and I'm not going to either. Yeah. <laughs> this building is freaky at night. I'm just telling you. There's noises that come through this like, well, I could just for the little bit. If I'd been watching all these AMC Halloween movies, I would be really in bad shape right now. All right, shield. Deflect, deflect. You are my glory. My glory. Um, the fall of Satan, Isaiah 14. The fall of Satan. I wish I understood more. I wish I could tell you more. One of the most indefinitive things for me to explain is the fall of Satan, Isaiah 14. There are seven and we can't go through it. Tonight. Seven falls of Satan. There are seven I wills of Satan found in Isaiah 14. What caused this? Glory. Glory. Translated pride. You are my pride. You are my glory. Not me, not what I've done, not what I can do. My glory. Number three, the lifter of my head. Who in your life is the lifter of your head? The encourager. Encourager. 
Some of you encourage, I mean, just you just you just natural at it. I mean, you can't help it. Even if you try not to, you encourage people. And I had a young pastor who was coming up to me years ago, and he, and he pastors on his own now. He's a great guy. But I would always take him with me on visits where their empathy was needed. Because he was just like, I mean, it's, it was, oh, man, my shoulder, my arm. It's like, and he would say, oh. And I would practice that in the mirror. Oh. You know. <laughs> but he would say, oh. And he'd sit down there. Fifteen minutes later, I mean, they're just like that. And I'm sitting over there. Yeah, okay, okay, you broke your arm. I'm sorry. Let's pray. We've got to move on. Got to go. Got to go. Oh, I'm just going to fix you your supper right here. And that's who he was. That was his, that was his beautiful gift. But he, and the, he was a lifter of the head. That's what this means. He was a lifter of the head. Get your head up. I used to say to my children, get your head up. When they're discouraged, get your head up now. Get your head up. Why? Because you can't have a keen sense of surroundings with your head down. People who fall often are looking down way too much. You've got to keep your head up. So some of you are naturally a lifter of the head. This is the lifter of the head. I tried to sing to my sister yesterday. I tried to talk to her yesterday. Look, this is blank, nothing there. And the nurse would say, keep trying, go on. Slap her around, tuck it. And I said, well, I've wanted to a lot of times, but I don't feel right now about doing it. And uh, she, no, come on, Jackie, wake, wake. That, uh, to try to say something in the blank stare, absolute blank stare. And when I was leaving, she said, don't be discouraged. You, you, some of that gets through. She said, I've done this for 21 years. I promise you, some of that gets through. She lifted up my head. Okay. So that's what that means. Look for the heads that are hanging down. Lift them up. Number four, you are my sustainer. Everything that starts has to be sustained. And when you start a plan, you say, uh, well, okay, I can do this for a week or two. Well, a week or two is going to come around real quick. That's not sustainable. What are we going to do to make a difference in this problem or this challenge? It's got to be sustainable. And you know what? Him being your shield, Him being your glory, Him being the lifter of your head is sustainable. You can get through anything. And look at His response. And I don't know how this happens, but by the time He gets to verse 5, I laid down and slept. I lay down and slept. No worry of the enemies that are rising from verse 1 and 2. No worries over the future enemy. If we read the rest of the chapter, we've got more enemies coming that we don't know about. No guilt over the past. I just sleep. If you ever ask me, how'd you sleep last night? I'm always going to tell you the same thing. Very well. I sleep very well when I ever get there. Now, it was 1240 when I went to sleep this morning. But I slept very well till 530. Very well. What happened? I have no idea. Do I you wake up? Nope. Dead as a world. Um, I sleep very well. Well, you have a clear conscience? I hope so. But that's not the point. Nor am I saying then that I have no worries of the enemies who are rising. I have no worry over future enemies that are coming. I have no guilt over the past. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying sleep is a beautiful, beautiful transition in life. You have to have it. Without it, we get kind of crazy. Some of you get cranky without sleep, right? A little cranky. Why, why does God use that? But when he said, I laid down and I slept, I was able to separate myself from all the mess. Able to separate myself. A lot of the counseling, I've counseled for years and years. I've done many, 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 many soldiers, sailors, marines, airmen. Um, and I think one of the, 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 the roughest thing for them, and a lot of firefighters who who have seen things or had to do things that they'll, they cannot erase out of your mind. And that's the hardest part of counseling is to help a person to separate uh, what they have seen, heard, felt, or been a part of. Anyway, my point to that is um, there's a great number of people in stressful situations that don't sleep well. And it's not because of worry of the past. It's just because of all the stuff. And it's hard to separate that. So every night that you go to bed and you can say, Lord, I thank you, we can lay this down now. I can lay it down uh, and separate myself from it. We'll pick it back up tomorrow. You're winning. You have a great shield. That's a wonderful thing to be able to do. I laid down and slept. In fact, I'm not going to be worried tomorrow of the ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. What does that mean? We're surrounded. We are surrounded. That's the future enemy. We'll get to that another. The, the enemies who are coming that I didn't even know about. There's a great story about, uh, in Vietnam, of a colonel 
Um, totally surrounded, Viet Cong, totally surrounded. They told him, you need to get out. He said, I can't, we're, we're pinned down. We've got them right where we want them. And you'd have to hear the whole story. We've got, it just changed, it turned the whole tide. We've got them right where we want them. They're all over. It's that kind of mentality that is able to separate what happened yesterday. And that's like the, the whole thing of PTSD, this, this thing that happens as a believer. Uh, my son came over and talked to me the other day, something he had been through and he saw as a captain on a firefighting team. And he said, you know, very little ever gets me, but this got me. And, and it's the same. I've dealt with police officers many, many times who, who instantly reacted how they had to react. But then afterwards, it all comes down. When the rush is over, everything goes back, and then they go into almost a basket situation. It is hard to separate and to make peace with your past. It really is. But even with those of us who are not living in that high a stressful era, we have to be able to separate that and go to bed at night. And so uh, I usually do this little ritual. I say, Lord, I'm not mad at anybody in this world. And if, Lord, if there's anybody mad at me tonight, let me know. I'll go call them right now. And sometimes the name comes, and I hate it when that happens. But sometimes it's there. No, there, you need to make a call there. Okay. That is putting it to the point where you can say, I'm going to rest tonight regardless of what happens. Because he is my shield. I can sleep tonight. That's what gives us peace. Now, Father, how we love you. We thank you again for such a beautiful day. Lord, I'm just amazed that we can sit down here and open your word and uh, find such application. Uh, all of us have family finances that are at stake now. It's not political, Lord. It hurts. It's costing us more. Some aren't able to function like they did last month. And already, Lord, we've, we've needed to help people who are, who are struggling. So I pray, Lord, that this, this thing called life that is really uh, garnering in around us, surrounding us, I pray that you'll give us this, uh, the shield, uh, that you're our sustainer, that we'll be able to sleep. The battle is yours and not ours, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.